Okay, on behalf of all of us at Columbia University, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome. I'm Safwan Masri, and I'm Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. Today, we'll be hearing from Columbia University President Lisi Bollinger and Dr. Agnes Calamar, Director of the Columbia University Global Freedom of Expression Initiative. In a discussion that will be moderated by Professor Mark Mazauer, President Bollinger and Dr. Calamar will share insights from their new book, Regardless of Frontiers, Global Freedom of Expression in a Troubled World. In 1948, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed a vision for the exercise of freedom of expression, regardless of frontiers. While that vision may have been global, the laws and norms related to freedom of expression and limits on it have, before and since 1948, been established typically at the national level. But in today's digital world, national boundaries are being erased. Ideas and information expressed by actors in one corner of the world can be accessed instantaneously or censored instantly by actors on the opposite side of the world. Which gives rise to a key question explored in the book. How can freedom of expression be secured at a global level? In this new volume, co-edited by President Bollinger and Dr. Calamar, leading experts from a variety of fields contributed essays that assess this question. The book explores ongoing and new challenges to free expression, from conflicts over hate speech and the rise of populism to authoritarian governments. Together, the essays lay the groundwork for an international legal doctrine on global freedom of expression that considers issues such as access to government health information, media diversity, and political speech. Doctors Calamar and Bollinger have, in this volume, arranged a colloquy that is essential for all of us living during this time of extreme pressure on the systems that undergird the values of free speech and the free flow of information. As we witness the law being weaponized and independent journalists silenced, sometimes permanently, it is ever more important to understand precisely what the global norms regarding the right to free speech are. How were they established and by what means? Who have been the essential players and defenders and why? How does a vision of universal freedom of expression play out in a world that is simultaneously digitized and interconnected, yet profoundly aware of and newly disrupted by borders and divisions? Regardless of Frontiers offers a comprehensive look into the evolution of freedom of expression and of information and how these rights have been interpreted, challenged, violated, and defended in disparate situations. One of the many achievements of this book is that the structure reifies the value of free speech in addressing and analyzing the issues from many perspectives and in a variety of settings. It puts into practice the very issue it is exploring. The book does not have any one agenda or solution or any particular worldview, but instead it serves as a reminder of the value of free speech itself. For those of us in need of hope, President Bollinger and Dr. Calamar document for us a world in which there are many, many defenders of free speech as a basic human right. And we come away from the book with a better understanding of the extensive nature of protections afforded this right. As the world risks renouncing previous commitments to freedom of expression, regardless of frontiers, serves as a timely reminder of just how much is at stake and what deserves protection. Our event today will be moderated by Professor Mark Mazauer, Columbia University's Director of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. The Institute opened at Reed Hall in Paris, home of the Columbia Global Centers Paris, in the fall of 2018, to connect scholars with leading artists, writers, composers, and filmmakers from around the world. Professor Mazauer is the Ira D. Wallach Professor of History, he specializes in modern Greece, 20th century Europe, and international history. The author of a dozen books, he also comments frequently on international affairs 
and he reviews books for the Financial Times, The Nation, the London Review of Books, the New York Review of Books, and others. Today's conversation promises to be nothing short of very illuminating. So let's get started. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Safan, for that kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure uh, and a privilege uh, to introduce the two authors of uh, this new book, Regardless of Frontiers. Uh, and I'd like to begin uh, with a man who needs no introduction, uh, President Lisi Bollinger, uh, who has been president of Colombia uh, since 2002. And before that was, of course, president of Michigan. Uh, and is, amongst other things, one of the nation's foremost uh, First Amendment scholars. Each full semester, he teaches a course on freedom of speech and press to Columbia undergraduate students. He's the author of a number of books on this subject. In 2018, The Free Speech Century, uh, which I'll come to, and he has no fewer than two books coming out this year, of which, regardless of frontiers, uh, is one. So, uh, President Bollinger, perhaps I can begin with you. Um, I came at this book as, as, um, as a historian. Uh, over the last 15 years, at the same time as globalization unfolded, um, historians became interested in the process and they became interested in the, in the history of international law and the history of human rights. And I found myself reflecting a little on that as I read it, because the first wave, and Colombia was very associated with this, I would say Colombia was the center of this, um, was to take the role of the critic, the critic of the lawyers, the critic of the human rights activists, um, to remind them uh, of power, of the contingency, of the ideological nature of the human rights enterprise. And on reflection, of course, that was very much a product of its own time too, of the Obama years in particular. Um, and over the last four or five years, the historians have, I think, started to question their own skepticism for obvious reasons. The world has become a nastier place. One couldn't take for granted that one was being skeptical in an essentially tolerant environment. And reading the book that you and Dr. Calamar have edited, I realized that as we have um, become, I think, more conscious of the uh, complexity of legal arguments and debates going on amongst human rights activists and policymakers, um, so the lawyers and the policymakers and the activists have been coming closer to us because what really struck me about this book was its lack of naivete. Uh, its willingness to accept the essentially contested nature of global norms. Um, the book seemed to me to do four things in one. Uh, there is a very useful conceptual uh, um, clearing away of some misconceptions about what norms are, for instance. Then there is, I think, the the core, which is, I wouldn't say encyclopedic, but to bring together an enormous array of cases, uh, episodes, uh, policies, documents, and to put, make some sense out of them. Um, the great merit of the book is that it's sensitive to political conflict. Uh, it, 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 it's not partisan. It understands that norms are contested and fought over. And then I think the fourth thing is that the book is itself um, part of its own subject. The book is arguing for uh, a global jurisprudence and the act of bringing all of this jurisprudence together is seen as, as, as contributing to that. So it is both a scholarly enterprise and, and an activist enterprise at the same time. And I think that gives the book a lot of its power. Um, so I want to start with a simple question uh, uh, and then move out from that. And uh, I think we would all like to hear from you in the first place, why uh, you wanted this book to appear and what you think it does. Oh, thanks, Mark. And I mean, those were uh, extremely astute and um, uh, profound, really, uh, observations and, and questions. Um, and thanks to Safwan for setting this up. Um, 
I, I maybe it's helpful for me to say sort of how I got to this uh, point. I uh, when I started uh, teaching in 1973, um, and um, as a young law professor. I decided to uh, build out my expertise, scholarship, and so on in the field of uh, free speech, First Amendment. Actually, there was no First Amendment scholar, you know, prior to about 1965. Harry Calvin at Chicago was uh, was really the first at any major law school. Uh, the cases around the jurisprudence around free speech and free press in the United States, as you know, and and we've talked about primarily derived from the 1960s and 70s. And the earliest ones are go back to post-World War I, 1919. So the whole free speech, free press jurisprudence of the United States is really a recent. It's no more than a century old. Um, at the turn of the new century, free speech jurisprudence scholarship cases in the United States about uh, the First Amendment are absolutely labyrinthine. They are <laughs> an incredible number of cases and articles and so on. Virtually none of that uh, sort of relates to the international scene on free speech and free press. All of that world of international norms and laws and, and practices and about freedom of speech and press around the world is done not by the First Amendment community of scholars, but by the international human rights scholars. And they're two separate uh, worlds. They overlap, there's some comparative law, there's some exchange between them, but essentially they were separate spheres of expertise and knowledge. And my feeling was uh, that this had to change, that it was an intellectual framework that would not match the world that was unfolding with all the forces of globalization for good or bad, the economic forces, the communications technology forces, the movements of people forces. You couldn't now with this new global uh, set of problems and global activities and a global communication system have these two separate worlds. So we needed to combine them. So that's just my own field. I think this happened all over the intellectual arena of uh, you yourself have been part of this uh, generating uh, idea of history as more global in focus and the like. So I'm just one of, of many. And the question was how to move a university in that direction. But the question also was how to move my own field and law. That's when we decided to set up a Committee on Global Thought, the Global Centers, and uh, in particular, Global Freedom of Expression. And I uh, fortunately was able to hire Anyas to come in and to lead this. Then the question is, how do you take that problem of integrating uh, knowledge in this new world and expertise and build it out? And Anya has done just a spectacular job of forming a database of cases, of trying to have annual conferences with meetings of people around the world, of establishing teaching materials for people who want to teach about global free expression, and then this book. Um, and this is the first of its kind, a tribute really to Anya's, uh, as she has so naturally uh, embraced this um, uh, this new world and how to focus on it. And, and that's how it's happened from my perspective. From my point of view, I got into this because of feeling ignorant. And, you know, that's not a good feeling when you're supposed to be an expert. So, um, so I hand it back to you and on to Anya's to- Thank you. That. Well, let me pick up a little bit on that, Lee, and I wanted to ask you a, co a question about sort of confidence and anxiety. One of the things that you, you, you've made very clear in the free speech century was how recent the free speech jurisprudence in the United States was. 20th yeah. century phenomenon, post First World War phenomenon. Um, it's possible, I suppose, the 21st century will be the century of global freedom of expression. We're in something extremely new. 
um, their, their are countervailing uh, attitudes towards that. One which many people adopt now and in the literature of the last three or four years, for obvious reasons, the note of anxiety has crept in. Uh, norms are on the retreat, liberalism is on the retreat, and so on. I'm, I, uh, and on the other hand, uh, th there is an alternative posture, which you could say is one of confidence. Isn't it remarkable? When you look at the fine-grained detail and you go away from the headlines, how much consolidation has taken place in extremely unglamorous quarters, regional courts, technical organizations, um, that is discussed in this book that suggests that, that, that al although nothing is forever, uh, some of these uh, um, uh, practices have won acceptance surprisingly quickly. So I, I suppose my question is, uh, uh, um, I read the book as cautious confidence uh, in what has been achieved. Was that, was that right? Should that be tempered in any way? I, I agree with that. That is, uh, who would have guessed that there would be a regional court in Africa in a major case declaring that criminalization of uh, libel is unacceptable under the uh, essentially constitutional norms of free speech and free press in Africa. I mean, that's an amazing kind of thing. You look at the cases involving the Inter-American Court uh, uh, I mean, for um, Latin America and the decisions there about freedom of information, you look, uh, uh, it's really quite surprising, even in courts of countries that we think of as semi-authoritarian and uh, stand up to uh, this is, is quite remarkable. There's more reason to be positive than, uh, than one might think. For me, to wrap this up of my own comments, this is a natural progression of what I saw unfold in the 20th century. That is, in 1960 in the United States, most free speech uh, rules were local. They were, they were individual cities or communities or states. And it was in the 1960s with the advent of television and radio, national communications technologies and national issues, civil rights issues became not local, but national war, et cetera, et cetera that the Supreme Court intervened and said, we're going to have national rules now about free speech, no longer local. We're in the same situation now with a international kind of uh, communication system, international problems, global problems like climate change, but no Supreme Court. And so the question is a fascinating one about how do you find some equilibrium in that world, and it's not surprising that there would be enormous tensions, pro-globalization against globalization, norms that uh, people fight about and so on. That's because it's very real and practical and that's where we ought to be. And that's where scholarship and universities should, should contribute. Thank you, thank you. Well, let me turn perhaps to uh, Agnès Calamar. Uh, who is the other editor of this volume, uh, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions, appointed by the UN's Human Rights Council. Um, she was the Executive Director of Article 19, a human rights organization, and she's currently, and since 2013, the Director of Columbia University's Global Freedom of Expression Project, and since uh, 2020, a visitor at the Institute for Ideas and Imagination, where we ex we're more than happy, we're fortunate to have her. Um, Dr. Kalamar, uh, I wondered um, if perhaps I could ask you something about the United Nations, which you've been associated with and its role. And um, uh, one of my favorite characters in the history of the United Nations was uh, a remarkable Australian called Sir Robert Jackson, possibly one of the most ad brilliant administrators international life has ever known, who was brought back into the United Nations in 1969 to recommend reform. Um, and he produced a famous report in, uh, uh, in 1969, which started off memorably by likening the system of the United Nations to that of a prehistoric monster that lumbered around uh, uh, sluggishly uh, and was, a, was a, 
an organism of, of such complexity that nobody could really understand how it worked. And he concluded reform was impossible. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what the role of the United Nations might be in global freedom of expression, because I suppose from one angle, uh, one could imagine that, that advocates for uh, greater freedom of expression might look to things like the Human Rights Council um, to be on their side. And yet I was very struck when I read Severine Arsene's essay, very interesting essay in your book on China, uh, that China is, is currently uh, um, very much in favor of a UN brokered in, uh, um, regime on freedom of expression as regards the internet and IT. And, and so that's something presumably that will give people pause who want a more globalized approach. I think it would be interesting to hear you reflect a little about the UN and how you see its role historically and going forward. Um, thank you very much, Mark, and um, thank you to, uh, to the Global Center for organizing this, um, the launch of our, of our book um, on the global, uh, global free speech without frontiers, but uh, unfortunately through video conference. Um, so be it. I hope we can do that in person uh, early next year. So the f there are a few things I want to say regarding the role of the United Nations. The first thing is that um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and in particular Article 19 of that covenant, is, is um, uh, the, the entry point into the construction of a global freedom of expression community and uh, system. It is uh, very much um, the starting point, uh, the, the place from which lawyers, activists, and states have began in order to understand, unpack, construct uh, global norms around freedom of expression. So the, the first um, thing we need to understand is that how much cynical we want to be or realistic we want to be about the United Nations. The, the, the driver for the construction of the global system is and remain international treaty and the ICCPR. However, what the book is also showing is that on its own, it would never have been sufficient to construct uh, a, a global understanding of uh, freedom of expression. And by this, I mean, an understanding that um, uh, is uh, that can be found um, and that reverberated across different jurisdictions and different regions. I do not necessarily mean that it is the same everywhere uh, or that there are no exceptions, but it is transnational and global enough in that there are enough jurisdictions, enough people, enough courts, enough states that have embraced fairly common principle on a range of free speech issues. And while Article 19 and the International Covenant was at the heart of that process, it would not have been enough if there had not been a the regional construction of Europe, Latin America, and now Africa, if there had not been regional conventions, and here we have very much um, similarities across those regional texts and the international text, and if there had not been lawyers, maybe some people may call them uh, activist lawyers, if there had not been judges and courts and parliamentarians willing to turn towards this global understanding to reform um, what was, you know, fairly uh, non progressive understanding of free speech until the, 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 the 1960s. The second point I think we need to understand, um, and, and the cautious confidence is a good description of what where we are at now, but I don't think we should undervalue or underestimate the remarkable transformation of freedom of expression from the 1960s to now. And why? Because when we look at, as an historian, you will understand, and I'm not, but when I was writing uh, my contribution and reviewing uh, the papers, 
you know, if you replace those, uh, the, the development of those norms in their historical context, we're talking about first the end of genocide, the Holocaust, and that carries forward for a good 10 years after World War II. Indeed, it's still very much part of who we are as a global community. Then you have the, the Cold War, and the Cold War was not synonymous uh, with a global search for common norms. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Then you have the decolonization, very uh, dramatic, very painful. You have the, um, uh, the positioning uh, against racism, against discrimination, against apartheid, which was a major cause of division within the United Nations. You have as well the, uh, in Latin America, for, for several decades, the, um, uh, the, the dictatorship uh, regime that were uh, a very important um, uh, element in the construction of a collective understanding of freedom of expression. So when you replace what has happened in that context, I think we need to acknowledge that this is nothing short of remarkable. And that is largely due to, as I said, um, lawyers, judges, activists, professors, uh, you know, dissident in, 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 uh, in Soviet Union, uh, activists in Latin America, people who fought for and against uh, colonia colonization. All of those actors contributed and all of those actors worked and acted within the context of the United Nations. It was within either at a diplomatic level, um, during conferences, or indeed in the search for, for instance, when um, uh, the treaty uh, against uh, racial discrimination was being uh, developed. Another treaty that never came, came about, but that's a very good reflection of the world we live in and why what we've achieved is remarkable. For decades, we tried to have a treaty on uh, religious and against religious discrimination, and that has never happened. Um, so there are, you know, when we replace uh, those developments in that historical context, I think we need to acknowledge that where we are at now, Mm -hmm. is quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And yet, yes, we can be cautious, cautiously confident, but we can also take uh, a great deal of, um, of pride in what um, all of those individuals uh, have achieved. And that has been done through, uh, through the United Nations. So um, I am, uh, you know, I'm, I work within, within that system at the moment as a special rapporteur. So I am very well placed to understand its limitations, um, including when it comes to the construction of social, uh, social norms uh, in, in, on, on internet. Why is China pushing for a UN driven process? Because the UN for China is the embodiment of national sovereignty. The UN is the embodiment of a system that is for and by nation state. While internet is standing for, is a multi-stakeholder uh, process. It's a multi-stakeholder creation. It doesn't owe much, actually it did not owe much to governments in its initial decades. It owed a great deal much more to individual engineers, to professors, to thinkers, and to corporate actors. There are many people in, in the world who want to preserve the multi-stakeholder nature of that remarkable uh, technological revolution, and they are fighting tooth and nails against a country like China, which is trying to force back national sovereignty over um, an instrument and a vision for our society that was meant to be without frontiers. Thank you. It's interesting, having written a little bit myself about the early years of the UN, to see that this tension between the vision of the UN as the defender of state sovereignty and the vision of the UN as the, the voice of the citizens of the world was hard baked into it from the very start, which is perhaps one of the things that explains its, its extraordinary longevity compared with its predecessors. I just wanted to 
bring you both perhaps into conversation a little bit around uh, one more issue, and that's the question of truth. Um, attitudes to truth in all of this. Uh, Dr. Kalamar, in your, in your essay in the book, you identify three grounds upon which, broadly speaking, people tend to argue for the benefits of global freedom of expression. And the first one is that it, that it conduces to the truth. It, it, it helps us uncover truths. And President Bollinger, I think you, you, this is rather your view. I was, I was reading your uh, Tanner lectures and you have this wonderful quote um, from Oliver Wendell Holmes, the best test of truth is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And I thought to myself, you know, that, that's a noble thought. Um, and how, how does that survive the age of Twitter and Facebook and social media? Can we still hold on to that as a rationale uh, for global freedom of expression. So uh, this is really open to both of you and perhaps to, to talk to each other. I don't know if you have similar views or different views on this. Anya, let's go right ahead. Oh my, <laughs> I was hoping you will jump in. Look, um, before I answer your question, Mark, I um, just wanted to, um, to give credit to President Lee Bollinger because he was far too modest at, uh, at the beginning of this uh, conversation. What I would like to highlight, and, and um, then I'll go back to truth, is that at the or one of the one of the the objective uh, we had, and very much because Ali um, uh, was driving that that objective throughout the um, the life of the uh, initiative, is whether or not, as an international community we have established something close to an international legal treaty related to freedom of expression, with treaty being understood not as an agreement um, you know, between states, but rather as an organically developed understanding of global norms. And, and Lee can elaborate more, but he was very much looking at how uh, some of the US contract law, for instance, developed in the early part of the 20th century. And we were trying to see whether uh, through this book and through the database, whether we could come up with a similar uh, organically developed understanding of, of freedom of expression. We have not yet necessarily um, do so because there is an enormous amount of work that this would uh, require, but I think we are getting closer through the database and through the book to understanding that those global norms are not impositions, they are developed through a discursive interaction between courts, between individuals, and indeed between non-state actors such as um, social media companies. And those interactions can very well be uh, over uh, uh, understanding of the meaning and why do we need uh, freedom of expression? Why, why is it so essential to our, um, to our societies, both national and international? It is because of the organically na organical nature of, of the process and of the outcome that I think um, while we are in the midst of what can only be described as intensive normative conflict, particularly played out in uh, the online sphere, I think if we take a long distance, which I'm sure you can do far better than I, I think we can see that this is part of the development and the emergence of some convergence. We're not there yet, but to imagine that we're gonna stop and be in that stage for the next, you know, 50, one, one century, I think is wrong. I think we are in the midst of looking for convergence. That's complex. It's eminently more complex because of the technology and because of the non-state actors, and as I point out in my chapter, because of the language. You know, we are not just talking about legal language here. We're not just talking about all of us being able to, across jurisdictions, have some kind of common language, the law, 
or common concept. You know, the, the construction of those of the truth um, and of norms in the online space is made far more complicated by the fact that we are dealing with an artificial language, with an artificial intelligence and with a language with it, which is at heart a mathematical language and a lot get lost in translation. Thank you. So um, uh, what uh, Agnes is referring to and talking about is, is really extremely important. And, and it's, 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 as you know so well, Mark, I mean, how uh, the world changes can be how people pay attention to things or how they respond as communities to things. And I was very struck, you know, if you go look back a um, hundred years to um, something like contract law in America, every little state had its own uh, development of doctrine about uh, jurisprudence, about contract law. And then some people came in, in the law school world, and they did treatises in which they would say in Oklahoma, they had decided this and in Tennessee, they've decided this. And they began to uh, talk about the whole and then the judges started referring to it in Oregon and, in, and pretty soon you had a common law for the United States. And that's kind of a little model for what's trying, we're trying to do here. In very simple kinds of moves like there never has been a place in the world where you can go and see what courts are deciding about free speech all over the world. And Anya's created that. Uh, and this book is an outgrowth of, of that. On the question you raised, Mark, about truth, it's, it's really, really interesting to me right now. And you, there are two dimensions to it. One is, to what extent should free speech be thought about, free press thought about in relation to a search for truth, something highly abstract and a little silly to even say it. Largely over the past 50 years, and you see this reflected around the world and in the, in the essays in the book, free speech, free press have been connected not so much anymore to search for truth, but to political self-government, democracy, and so on. I'm very much of the view and just beginning a project now of trying to resituate free speech, free press, not exclusively to, uh, to this, but to the search for knowledge and truth as well as for political, democratic or government assent. And the reason I want to do this is because I think we are underestimating <clears throat> the role that universities, the system of universities play in a, in a society in advancing knowledge, the independence they need for that, the protections against government interference. And when you think about the modern world, uh, almost everything is connected to knowledge that was developed within universities in the past hundred years or so. You know, modern technology and uh, understandings about things. And so linking free speech, free press to that system of, of knowledge and understanding, I think is really important. And lastly, your, your question about can we really live with the internet in its construction now with social media platforms and continue to be confident that an open discussion without government interference will actually produce self-government uh, and will it actually produce the kind of knowledge that we need is one of the profound questions of the next several decades. I mean, people are questioning that uh, every single day and I think uh, rightly so. Thank you. I know that there will be a lot of questions uh, and I think we should try to allow time for other people to have their say. So let me hand back to Safwan Masri, who's going to chair the question and answer session. Safwan, thank you, Mark. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lee and Anya. So we have a few questions and um, <clears throat> the first one um, that I'm going to ask you to comment on, uh, maybe uh, starting uh, with you, Agnes, um, is the to comment on the recent episodes of violence against journalists. And this comes from Tom Trabat, uh, who directs our Rio uh, Global Center. 
And uh, Tom is asking specifically about the Khajukri case and uh, what will uh, do you expect uh, the UN might uh, do? You were the rapporteur for that. And to Tom and to everybody else, I also want to say that I recently saw the documentary uh, Kingdom of Silence and really enjoyed Agnes uh, seeing you and hearing you <laughs> um, on camera uh, comment on this. Uh, so talk to us about um, the work that you've done and um, you know where do you think this will uh, will end up and maybe what were some of the frustrations that you faced? Um, so um... You know, of course, violence against journalists uh, is the ultimate form of censorship. So throughout my, my work and my career, um, it has been um, an important focus of my work. It is not um, a very normative issue at the end of the day. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of um, uh, it's one that requires uh, political will to tackle, and it's one uh, that um, demands um, an organized commitment towards protection and, and prevention. The case of Jamal Khashoggi stand out because of the brazen nature of the attacks and the killings because of the cruelty involved um, um, because it took place in, um, in, on the territory of another country. Uh, it was a state-sponsored killing um, and it uh, violated some, a range of essential values and principle of international relations and, and international law. Uh, what, um, I think what stood out with that case is the fact that maybe because Jamal was a US resident, maybe because he worked for the Washington Post, there was a generalized outcry within the international media community, uh, within um, uh, a range of actors, in fact, that has meant that it remained a, a crucial uh, issue on the international agenda and forced it. Um, force the international community to confront its own uh, willingness to uh, turn the page and to confront its uh, willingness to be complicit, if not in the killing, but in the impunity that is attached to the killing. And I think Jamal Khashoggi matters for many reasons, of course, but the case matters because it is the moment where a number of actors have said it's not good enough to institute an international day against impunity for crimes against journalists. We actually need to make it our, each and every one of us responsibility to fight it. That's what the international media has done repeatedly. That's what the documentary makers have done. That's what I have uh, tried to do through my uh, international investigations and the story keeps keeps remaining on the international agenda. And it's not only good for the search for justice for Jamal, it's good for uh, all of the act of violence um, against journalists. Uh, in my own work, my own investigation has highlighted, you know, all of the uh, problems and limitations attached to um, the impunity regime that is dominating, in fact, international crimes against journalists. It has also shown how uh, ill-prepared we are as an international community to combat violence against uh, journalists. We do not have an international instrument to investigate those crimes. So if a state is unwilling or unable to do it, frankly, there is no one else that will be able to do it. And that to me, um, uh, is something that we can address as an international community. We should not just be reliant on people like me to decide to do it. There should be a standing instrument, an international instrument that investigate uh, crimes against uh, journalists 
you know, dissident human rights uh, defenders, crimes against freedom of expression. We should have an international instrument to do so. And we should have the capacity eventually to move towards prosecution. So it's one thing to uncover the truth and it's extremely important. Uh, the second step as an international community is to find a space, we don't have that yet, to find a space where the perpetrators, including the mastermind, uh, which are usually at the highest level of the government, will be tried and will face uh, the um, uh, justice for the crimes they have ordered. We don't have that yet as an international community. And to me, it is incumbent, incumbent upon us to really, uh, as we are looking at the next iteration of that international system, um, we have developed a range of international norms, global norms for a number of issues and the, the book detailed them uh, very well, but it is now incumbent upon us to move towards a far more implementation stage for the international community and that could come through uh, an investigatory branch, which does not um, does not exist at the moment. And uh, just to, to highlight, to, to bring that back actually to the, 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 the book, there is a chapter in the book on impunity for killings of journalists. Uh, it's written by Joel uh, Simon, uh, Simon and Elizabeth Witchell, who are both uh, for the Committee to Protect Journalists and who led the international campaign uh, against impunity. And they detail very well how um, when they started, there was very little awareness about the fact that killings of journalists had such a high rate of impunity attached to them. And it is through their work and that of local organization and other international organizations that we have now an international awareness about the fact that freedom of expression, which is a norm that in many countries is being highlighted as central to our societies, and yet we are unable to protect the very actors who are uh, making that, uh, who are giving meaning to that norm. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you. Very, very helpful. And it's uh, fascinating. I mean, it all is, of course, but the uh, there is the investigations, if you will, and the search for the truth, uh, which is something you've been involved in, but then there is holding people accountable, and that's where you're saying we have the uh, greatest sort of gap or lack of uh, instruments. But even on the investigation part, I mean, it's fair to say that probably there was a lot that was mobilized in this case because of its high profile, because Jamal uh, was a U.S. resident and a writer for the Washington Post. Uh, but I know that you pursue also uh, all kinds of cases uh, that are much lesser known. Mm -hmm. Let me maybe with that turn to you, President Wallinger. And uh, Malvina Liss uh, Dobradin is asking uh, whether there are any legal cases that are pending um, that may be highlighted um, that could eventually serve uh, as a precedent, perhaps, for uh, the uh, organic, what she's calling the organic formation of global norms on freedom of expression. Um, are there global legal cases that one should uh, pay attention to and follow um, and learn from? So let me just say, uh, Safon, uh, thanks again for doing this. And and um, uh, on Anya's and Khashoggi and and that uh, horrible uh, uh, set of issues, um, Anya's was incredibly brave in taking this on through her role uh, as a rapporteur uh, within the um, UN system. Uh, in, incredibly brave, courageous, and it really played a very important role in this. The Washington Post, you know, wouldn't let this go. And, and that played a very important uh, role in keeping it um, front and center. To me, it's, um, I, I, I mean, apart from the, just the abhorrent nature of what happened, it's a very good illustration of the practical problems to be dealt with in the modern world. 
uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, somebody could say something in the United States, write a column in a, in a newspaper as uh, Jamal Khashoggi did, and it could be very critical of Russia and the government, it could be very critical of other, and they wouldn't care. They wouldn't care because it wouldn't get to their population. Today in the global internet world, uh, everything gets, I mean, you, whatever you say becomes global. And uh, that has created these tensions about foreign censorship of speech in countries, including the United States. So, so we have many examples of people writing things, saying things from the United States, let's say, uh, publishing books, whatever, and then they're sued for libel in other countries, or they're prosecuted for crimes in other countries. Um, the uh, top executives of Google have several convictions uh, uh, that they have faced around the world because of, um, of speech that their uh, platform has published. There's that. There's also that we need to hear more what people around the world say. So it's not just an abstract uh, kind of thing. You would be, you know, human rights, all of which we favor, all of us favor, but it's no longer just human rights um, that we are trying to preserve. It's the need to hear and to discuss and to think. I mean, you, if you think about climate change as the prime global issue, the only way that's going to be dealt with is by massive conversations, massive numbers of conversations all throughout the world uh, over time. And uh, so it's a, you know, how do you work out a system of, of norms and rules and laws that will govern that. That's the problem. And, and the Khashoggi case is a vivid and horrific example of that. As far as modern or cases coming up, I mean, I, I you know, just these issues about who controls the internet, uh, what is the, what are going to be the, um, uh, how are we going to deal with a world in which there are very few private owners operating in a for-profit model uh, using um, so-called algorithms that have enormous impact on what it is that is heard, by whom, to whom, and so on. Uh, I mean, that is in the form of a rising set of problems that one should uh, really pay close attention to. Um, I, I, you know, Anya's give us an example of a case that's in the European Court of Justice or in, um, uh, well, in Africa. Well, the First Amendment. I mean, you know, in, in, in the volume, in the book, we are uh, highlighting the journey taken by various uh, decisions. And um, it, it is um, uh, thanks to, to uh, Lee's vision that we now have that database which allows us to track down how a decision taken in the 1960s has been used you know, in the US has been then referred to in India and then in the Philippines and back to Europe. And how in each of those iteration, that yeah. decisions may take a different meaning, not, not completely opposed to its original meaning, but it may get localized, if I, if I can say so. So one of the fundamental decisions in the US First Amendment jurisprudence is Sullivan versus New York Times. And that is, uh, that is one of the most cited decisions internationally. Uh, and you find it in almost every region of the world. It is not always um, used or referred to uh, and embraced in terms of the standard that uh, of strict scrutiny that is uh, part of it, but the principle at the heart of the decision is something that you are going to find in There's many something. other jurisdictions. Um, yeah, Lee, you wanted to say something. I just want to say there's something really poetic uh, about this because New York Times versus Sullivan, 1964, was the U United States Supreme Court saying Alabama cannot have its own rules of defamation applied to the New York Times for an article 
published an advertisement published critical of the uh, uh, county commissioner and the police in Alabama. We can't have that kind of Alabama censoring uh, things in the New York Times that we all want to read. That decision, as Anya said, is now the most one of the most cited decisions all around the world as the world tries to figure out can Russia decide what it is that we're going to allow in Germany? Or can Germany decide what we're going to allow in the United States? I mean, this, these are, you know, this is the, the problem exploded into this global scene. I'm sorry, Agnes, go ahead. No, no, that's exactly it. And that's why I, I spoke, and I think Malwina, that's where our question spoke about an organically uh, developed concept because in each of the stage where the decision is going to be mentioned, the judge that is going to be mentioning it may give it a little twist. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is how we, uh, at the end of a journey, may have uh, a common understanding of the principle and then a differentiated understanding of how to implement it. So yeah. another example of that is Google, Google Spain. It is the, the decision around the right to be forgotten. Um, the notion that online um, you can actually be forgotten if the information that has been put online is no longer relevant, uh, no longer has any public value, public interest value and so on. A, a, a decision that has been uh, taken in Europe and has been uh, widely criticized, particularly in the United States. But when you study the decision, you realize that in fact, very quickly for, for a controversial decision, extraordinarily quickly in a matter of weeks uh, and then months, that decision was then cited in other countries in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia. And in each of those, uh, citation, the principle that one has the right to be forgotten is acknowledged and recognized, but in each jurisdiction, that principle is going to be implemented differently. Either, either the court is going to ask that the source, the original source be um, uh, blanked out, or it is going to ask that uh, the, uh, the information can only be accessed into a certain jurisdiction and so on and so forth. So that's an example of how an eminently crucial principle is acknowledged as having a global value, but how it's being implemented may take some uh, distinctive local flavor. Thank you, Agnes. We, I mean, we could go on and on and on, um, and it's such a fascinating conversation and seeing the two of you not only talk about uh, the book, but really um, this incredibly important topic with all of its dimensions. So we might go over by a couple of minutes, if that's okay. What I'd like to do is bring together uh, just some of the thematic questions into one question, um, and then, to you, Agnes, and then pose a question uh, to you, Lee, and one to you, Mark, um, if you don't mind. And uh, you can then each share your closing, um, uh, your closing remarks, any uh, final thoughts. So, Agnes, there's a lot of comment about the United Nations. I don't expect you to address it all, but let me just uh, uh, try to uh, bring it into focus. So, one is from our colleague and friend, uh, Ken Pruitt. Um, who says that the irony of the UN's otherwise important free speech agenda is the way it muzzles its own senior staff who are on the front line uh, with much to offer. Um, Joy Fairbanks asks about uh, regional agreements and organizations that are supportive or destructive uh, in the UN's efforts, uh, if you can comment on this. And then um, Julian Banar also asks about the um, uh, you know, the, the contradictions perhaps regarding the United Nations and uh, the US and its allies uh, perhaps losing credibility around the world when they try to dictate and control international norms. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are other questions, but, you know, just sort of on the UN perhaps and its role and its perhaps inherent um, contradictions or 
uh, ironies and you know its its role around the world um, and and to what extent is is it being supported um so before you answer that let me pose the questions to lee and to uh, and to mark uh, President Bollinger, maybe we can talk a little bit about social media in particular, and uh, um, both in terms of how does one, I mean, this is something that crosses borders, right? I mean, you know, where frontiers really do not matter. And, uh, um, you know, how, what, what do you anticipate will emerge? Uh, you see what's happening with Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg and uh, uh, the power of algorithms that undergird uh, social media platforms. Um, do we expect that um, things will emerge vis-a-vis -vis social media that will uh, regulate it perhaps? I mean, I remember conversations that you and I had 10 and 15 years ago um, about self-regulation, um, have we seen that? Do we expect um, some to come? And Mark, one of your, you've written so many great books. So one of the ones that I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed them all, uh, all that I've read, uh, but one in particular sticks uh, in my mind as we're discussing this, and that's Governing the World, where you reviewed sort of the role of international organizations and how they came into being and so on. Uh, what do you anticipate? You know, what do you uh, predict? Uh, do you see the emergence of international institutions that could um, play an important role? Uh, and I know it's too broad of a question, but I'd love for you to comment um, on um, on that. So, Agnes, over to you. Thank you. Well, look, uh, the UN is as good as we make it. Huh? It's um, it's uh, made up of mem member states. When we talk of the UN, we either talk of a bureaucracy of an institution or we talk of member states. So uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, to the members uh, at the moment, we are in the midst of um, a profound uh, crisis over the international system, the, the conflict between um, superpowers have taken on an edge that we had not experienced for uh, for quite uh, for quite a long time, and we don't know, you know, where it it is going to go. I think um, in in the volume we do try to interrogate how the post World War II system, which has allowed for the creation of and uh, the those uh, global norm on freedom of expression, the fact that it is currently under assault or under duress. Um, you know, what is it going to be replaced with? There are many weaknesses with the current institutions that we may wish to, um, to reform, um, but we may lose far more uh, through that process than maybe we would be expecting. Um, who control the UN? Who can play a major role over the UN uh, does have an edge over the uh, control of the um, of of the world, which is certainly what some of the superpower would like um, would like to achieve. So, in that context, freedom of expression is a major is a major issue. Why? Because, um, well, for the reason that Lee has uh, highlighted before, because expression is communicated without frontiers, because what uh, it's very difficult for government currently to control uh, information in the way they may have been able to do so in, in the past, but also because the technology that underpin freedom of expression nowadays is, um, is the information technology. It is the technology uh, and the revolution uh, the, the technological revolution at the heart of the construction of that new system. It is a technology that can be, uh, that determine the outcome or indeed that can drive warfare. Uh, cyber security is exactly what we are talking about. It is about national security expressed through and by um, uh, the online uh, control and, and cyber system. So for all those reasons, 
uh, freedom of expression, freedom of information, because it is in many ways the embodiment of that new uh, technology, which has become and underpinning uh, national security, economic growth, um, and a range of other things. It is defining our world. So uh, the UN uh, as uh, the vector through which the control over that technology is being fought out uh, is gonna be uh, very much um, a place of conflict for, for the years to come. That's why we need to be there. That's why we need to be, to be present. But I have to say, while we, we want to fight, uh, we also need to be fully aware that uh, that institution need reforming. Uh, this is not a perfect institution. The, 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 uh, the Security Council needs reforming. Uh, so we've got to fight and preserve what we have achieved, but we cannot do so by uh, refusing to, um, to reform what uh, has become way outdated. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contributions and thank you for all that you do. Uh, President Wallinger, Lee? Yeah, so I mean, we have very little time and of course these are <laughs> immense issues. I would just say uh, the way I try to think about this is we are entering or have entered into a very great debate in the world. And we're not going to settle this by some kind of uh, inventing a, a global Supreme Court or a UN Supreme Court. We're going to uh, resolve it or not resolve it through talking, through discussion, through our actions and so on. And that great debate is the United States and, and other uh, countries, but especially the United States, has developed an idea really quite recent labeled from the beginning an experiment that allowing really extreme uh, protection and freedom for speech, false speech, hate speech, neo-Nazis, Klan, uh, speech that uh, in, you know, hurts people's privacy, enormous protections for speech. And institutions within that media of all kinds and lots of protections including publication of classified information of the government and national security, that incredible scope of protection that has never existed before in any country. Um, whether that's going to lead to a, a you know, more inventive, uh, uh, you know, just and, and good uh, society, democratic society over time, or, as uh, I had a debate once with the uh, equivalent of the Attorney General of Singapore, or is that going to bring uh, government by extremes, uh, the elimination of uh, a middle, uh, distrust in government, uh, violence and hatred towards each other, and a collapse of, uh, of a society that you cannot live successfully in a world in which you allow that kind of uh, protection for speech to exist. And instead, you need to have uh, limits uh, that uh, respect the government. Uh, uh, you cannot uh, propagate falsehoods, etc. That debate is a serious one, and I think we need to engage it. Um, the social media platforms magnify this enormously. And, and are beginning to you know, cast doubt uh, of those who are solidly on the first side, on the kind of, let's just call it the free speech First Amendment side. Is that really um, how this is going to play out? And has this new technology, uh, is it operated in a way uh, that will uh, magnify the flaws in the experiment? So that's a question of enormous debate. When I look at this, I say, how do you establish policies, government, when you have a new technology of communication and you do not understand it well? It's incredibly expansive in its opportunities for speech, and that's great, but it also has these fears. 
Well, we do have an example, and that was the radio and TV broadcasting that came in in the 20s, and the government established uh, the FCC and a broad power to uh, regulate. And that was upheld by the Supreme Court multiple times with lots of regulation, fairness doctrine, uh, monitoring of, of the speech that happened. Uh, there's something in that experience that I think can be carried forward to this new world, but that's a really open question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Mark? Sure. Uh, um, future of the world in one minute. I just want to make <laughs> yes. three, three points, really. The first is that although we are facing unprecedented international challenges, uh, I, I don't myself think it probable that we'll see major international institutional innovation. And I say that with regret because I believe in institutions, but I think that you need to, you need historically, well, historically you've had two things for, for that kind of innovation. First of all, you've had catastrophe and not merely the knowledge of impending catastrophe, but actual catastrophe. And the second is you need a theory of institutional government. And uh, I don't think we have either of those. Uh, the second thing I think is the UN will survive for the reasons that we've discussed, that it can serve a lot of different needs and therefore it will always remain the ambivalent, ambiguous organization that we know. Uh, and the debate and the demand for reform of the UN started at the beginning and will go on for a long time yet. Um, but I take the Robert Jackson view of the United Nations. And, and actually, the third and last thing I want to say is it seems to me, you know, I, thinking about 200 years of international life, international arrangements in, the, in 1815, in 1919, in 1940, uh, compared with those, we live in a situation of unbelievable complexity. And complexity seems to me to be the condition. I mean, we just live in a landscape that nobody can get their head round. They can't get their head around it institutionally. They can't get their head around it technically. There's a wonderful bit in the book about terms of service agreements and what light they shine, the reality of the rule of law. So that it seems to me if there's one thing we, we want to try to encourage, it, it's thinking about ways of making this complexity comprehensible, of getting beyond technicalities, finding new ways to do that, new ways, uh, new ways to make all of this comprehensible, because that's the only way I think that there's any prospect of changing it, really. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you to all the participants and those who post questions and listen in. And thank you to all of those who work very hard behind the scenes uh, at the Paris Global Center in putting this together. Um, this was so incredibly rich. It's a great book. Congratulations. And I know it's been published by Columbia University Press and will be released in early February. So I encourage everybody to get their hands on a copy. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.